thank you for this time. Thank you for the people that are here. Father, may this be a time of blessing for us all as we look into your word. Uh, Father, we are gathered here to understand what it is that you want to say to us. And there are things that are happening in our lives that we need to apply this to. And we want to be faithful to it. So, Father, we ask that you would speak in truth here. And that uh, any lies or misunderstandings would be corrected. And that we would walk away and really have learned something and really want to <coughs> apply it to our lives. We trust you, Lord, and we entrust this time to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So there is a famous song by the birds, a band a th- way back in the 60s. Uh, they did a song based off of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and the name of the song is Turn, Turn, Turn. This would have been an excellent opportunity to have that song for you, but I'm sure you've all, has anybody not heard the song? You can sing it, go ahead. I'm not going to sing it. That's not not one of my songs. Uh, I only sing my songs, I guess. All right, Uh, but Turn, Turn, Turn is based off of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and so if you would be so kind as to turn, turn, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Um, But before that, I wanted to go over some things. I was reflecting on uh, last week, and uh, last night, actually, I had my mother and father were over, and I have this box that I got from my grandfather, and it's got all this stuff in it that means nothing to him, uh, because it pertains to his wife's side of the family. It's a box full of trinkets and whatnot. I've got it. Right here, old, old stuff. This here has a date on it. December 18th, 1906. It says it right here. Other, I got a social security card. <coughs> a social, an actual, I'm not kidding, social security card for Ella S. Spence. She's dead now, and I got her card. 1930 something? Oh, wow. It doesn't have a date, it just has her number. And that it's not supposed to be used for all the things we use it for now. Um, I also, I have medals from an unknown war, unknown service, man. I got ranks, stars and stuff. I got, this is John, that's my uh, great-grandfather's. He was John, all right? Here's a, a watch. This was really important to somebody, I guarantee you. It doesn't work anymore, but it was really important, right? I got a, a, a Rex charger. I don't know what you do with it. You, you pull this out. So it's got some ear, or, uh, hearing aids, probably. Who knows? I got a razor. I got a thing that has something on it. A chain. Right? And I got so many pictures. I mean, pictures of people. I will never know who they are, but I'm related to them in some fashion. Some people say that I actually have my great-grandfather's eyes. Okay? Oh dear. That's not true. There's no truth to it. For I only have my great grandfather's eye, his glass eye, which has not been cleaned. Oh, but I let, that's lovely. Let, let you see it or I see you. <laughs> so, yeah, this is his actual glass eye. Yeah, look, Ryan. Check it out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got my eye on you. <laughs> So, did you see it? Yeah, I see it. Okay, so I don't have his. I don't have his eyes. Hey, can you show us how to put it on? I, 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 you know what? I didn't even realize he had one. I kind of uh, The point is, I have this really important stuff. Okay, and I have all these pictures of all these unknown people. And when I started asking my grandfather, my grandfather, the name, I was handing him the photos. And he was writing stuff on the back. He said, oh, that's old Ella Thogmore. And he'd write it on there. And then about 30 minutes of him doing that, I said, who are these crazy names? He said, I don't know. I'm making them up. (laughs) (laughs) That's just like him to do. I love him him dearly. Uh, But as I was looking at all this stuff, and, and my mom was just so interested in it, and we were both just... We love history and that sort of thing, and thinking, man, I wonder what all this is. It was really important to somebody at some point. I mean, look at this crazy box. Forgotten. Totally forgotten now. 
Who, whoever it was important to, they're dead, they're gone, I have it. It means so much less to me. I just It's like holding a mystery. This means, it's like that scene in Close Encounters of the Third Kind where Richard Dreyfus makes the mountain out of the mashed potatoes and he says, this means something, right? So it's nebulous. Uh, our lives are like that, right? Someday, those glasses on your head are going to be smashed or, or maybe somebody's going to have them say, this belonged to some relative of mine, but I don't care about it. And maybe they throw it away. Who knows? I mean, although the glass eye will probably stand the test of time. Uh, question. How deep and how long does futility go? What a beautiful question. <laughs> You know, Solomon keeps writing, I looked into this, I looked into that, and behold, it was futile, a chasing after the wind. How deep and how long does futility go in that sense? 32 weeks. 32 weeks. Certain futile things do, sure, 32 weeks. Uh, what about to the unbeliever who dies in their unbelief? Eternity. It is pretty stinking scary, all right? But you always have to keep the conclusion in mind as you read through and study Ecclesiastes. And the end of the matter is fear God and obey his commandments. Because God is going to bring into question everything that you've done. He's going to put light on it. He's going to bring it into judgment. Okay? Whether good or bad. All right, for the uh, non-believer... <laughs> There's no hope. For the believer, we have Christ. Christ is our hope, and that's what we trust in. So as we read and study through, always keep this in mind, because if you don't, you're not going to take it in context, and you're going to let the futility of it kind of shape you, and you might become jaded if you don't study it correctly. Okay, and I hope today we can kind of find the cure for it. So uh, I do have a test, though, to start you off. I found this quote. The quote might be pretty annoying. Okay? And then you, but you tell me what you think about it. Uh, this guy said, Faith learns to live with seeming inconsistencies and absurdities, for we live by promises and not by explanations. This being said of Christians. What do you think about this quote? I like it. Works for me. Works for me. Really? You think it's true? Okay. So is the Bible inconsistent and absurd? No, they're seeming inconsistencies. We don't have explanations for it. There are inconsistencies between the Bible and life. Like what? The like Bible evolution or, or binary? What? I said. I said just between the Bible and our understanding. That's the inconsistency. Wow. There's the inconsistency wow. between what is. And You're what ruining be. everything. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, are we supposed to say we don't agree with it? I don't agree with it. No, you're supposed to say whatever you think. Should we be offended? No. I don't know. I, I feel this way. All right, fine. Fine. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, we, we will revisit this later, and it'll, it'll, it's ruined now, but that's all right. I like voices are there for responses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, if you're not what careful... What I think for me is that this is all poppycock. <laughs> you, you can take this, because the, the thing that I that gets under my skin is when atheists say that the Bible is filled with, it's inconsistent, it's absurd, and it's ridiculous, and you people, you just uh, live up by uh, promises that, that don't make any sense at all, and you guys are complete morons. But you didn't see it that way, that's all right. But there are seeming inconsistencies. I mean, the, the way the different Gospels say who saw Jesus first, and who, I mean, there's lots of different, which I understand the, those as not being inconsistencies, for certain reasons, but it seems to some people that they are. Well, we'll stew in this for a little bit. But I did want to show you where we are headed today. At least one of the main, not main points, one of the one of the minor points is that Solomon is wiser than He-Man. Okay. This is why not many people are here today. <laughs> in anticipation. All right, let's look in chapter three, verse one. There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven. Your translation may say season, but there's 
two different senses of the word time going on. An appointed time is the when of an event. When that event is going to occur, and the season or time is the actual duration of the event. The event is going to occur today until 12.15. Class mm -hmm. today is going to run until... I mean, you're going to have to endure the duration of this class. Um, but Solomon's point is that all of these events will happen in their appointed time, all the events that he's about to discuss. They're going to happen in their appointed time, okay? And for their appointed duration. And something for you to think about is who appoints the times and the duration? Who has control? Those sorts of things. So let's read this cool poem uh, of opposites that uh, Solomon has written here. I'll start with verse 1. So there is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven. A time to give birth, or a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to throw stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. A time to search and a time to give up is lost. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear apart and a time to sew together. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. This poem supports what he had just said in verse 1. There's an appointed time and a duration of that event for everything, right? And the cool thing about using opposites, uh, born, die, is it covers everything in between, right? All the different shades of life, right? Now, all the different <coughs> possible outcomes. Uh, we won't break into groups today to discuss this, uh, but how can you find the context of this poem? Let's just have a discussion. Number one, how can you find the context of this poem? It's a plastic hippo that's been cut in half. Huh? You, to make you sad? No, it's plastic. It's a better. Actually, it looks like a chocolate hippo. Maybe some <laughs> Easter thing than some. Oh, we don't have any problem with chocolate hippos. Culture, right? This is a. We know what to do with those. Plastic hippo that's been kind of. So, how can you find the context of this poem? And the surrounding text. Okay, the surrounding text. All right, and specifically what surrounding text in here? What comes before right. and or after. All right, what comes before yeah. and or after. Okay, that's... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that sounds like a neat surrounding. And <laughs> what if you, you don't look to those texts and you just read the poem as is? I mean, is he just stating the obvious? Well, in the song, of course, it's used in a very secular manner. Okay. I always get those two mixed up. This is a way that you can live your life and accept what comes and doesn't come and, and all that. It's very fatalistic, like nothing you can do about it. You just have to endure it and go through it and hope for when the good times come. Um, it doesn't, if you took it by itself, it wouldn't necessarily have anything. You wouldn't think anything about God or anything like that about it. Hmm. Awesome. Also the cultural context that the time was written. Okay, the cultural context as well, right. What else? Who it was written by. Right. Who? To. Who to? All the who to's. Okay. So what is the context of this poem? Or, or shall we look? Well, our, our inspired punctuators put a colon after verse one. Our inspired punctuators. <laughs> I've never heard that before. That's awesome. So obviously, this whole thing is related to verse one. It's someone's mind. 
Mind Spire punctuator put a hyphen. Yeah. I guess cool. <laughs> yeah. In the ESD. It's a nuance of the NAS. <laughs> okay. Colvin, all right. I'm okay. sorry, it popped out before I even... Well, let's, let's talk then about uh, the context, and then we'll get into, or we'll, we'll talk about how do you find the context. All the things you said are right. You know, you got to read the whole chapter. you got to read the whole section, what came before, what's coming after. And you have to read the whole book, and then you have to read the whole Bible. And along the way, you need to ask all these questions. Who, what, when, where, why, how? Who wrote it? When was it written? Who was it written to? Uh, how are they supposed to understand it? How are we supposed to understand it? What type of word is that? All these sorts of questions. And so there is a, a little bit of a distinction between hippos, right? A real hippos, not plastic one. Because yeah. there are hungry hippos, but as uh, this one here, he's just a hungry, he's not a hungry, hungry. If you want to be a hungry, hungry hippo, then you've got to do all of these kind of steps. Man, that's terrible. All right, so let's talk about the actual context. And for the actual context, we'll have to read the next section, starting in verse 9, uh, all the way to 22. So what profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? I have seen the task which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. He has made everything appropriate or beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor. It is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it, and there is nothing to take from it. For God has so worked that men should fear him. That which is has been already, and that which will be has already been, for God seeks what has passed by. Furthermore, I have seen under the sun that in the place of justice there is wickedness, and in the place of righteousness there is wickedness. I said to myself, God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man, for a time for every matter and for every deed is there. I said to myself concerning the sons of men, God has surely tested them in order for them to see that they are but beasts. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so does the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath, and there is no advantage for man over beast, for all his vanity. For all is, for all is vanity. All go to the same place. All came from the dust and all return to the dust. Who knows that the breath of man ascends upward, and the breath of the beast descends downward to the earth. I have seen that nothing is better than that man should be happy in his activities, for this is his lot. For who will bring him to see what will occur after him? And then, of course, you flip over to chapter 12. And then the nice thing about thinking about the conclusion of, of this whole matter is, 12, 13, 14. And that's right in a row. Just remember chapter 12, verses 13 through 14. The conclusion, when all has been heard. How's that for context? When all has been heard. The conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Okay. So the, the question is, who is ultimately in charge of the appointed times and duration? God. Okay, God. We also have choosing in there, right? Uh, a time to plant. Did, did God plant that? Or did you? Did you uproot it or did God, right? But I didn't grow it. Okay, you, you didn't make it grow. That's you can plant it very anytime. Kind of you can plant it anytime, but there really is a time to do that. Like, you can plant stuff in the winter. I sort of think that's that time. That's right. But you're, you're still, your activities can be more or less futile if you're within, you know, the time that it's appointed for that thing. Yeah. And ultimately, he's in control of 
everything that happens, it's working towards his plan, and he cannot be added to or taken away from regardless of what you choose to do, which is pretty fascinating. Uh, so, and the thing about the list, and you can go through the list with a fine-tooth comb and analyze every little detail and group them together in this type of theme or that type of theme and talk about how there, it's a multiple of seven, it's the perfect list and all that stuff. The point is, though, of the list itself, of all these events, is it covers a multitude of things in your life. Emotions, uh, physical things that you do, projects that you undertake, national issues, personal issues, life and death, chases, escapes. Maybe not chases and escapes, but it, it covers everything. So what should your response, given this, who is ultimately in charge of, and this works great to Greg's blank page illustration today, for those of you that were in the service, um, it's the contract you have with God, it's a blank page, and he wants you to sign your name to it, and you say, well, I don't know what's written on it. He says, do you trust me? Sign it. This is, this is the same thing that's right here. What should your response be to these times and durations that God has ordained for his purpose, for his plan, which nothing can be taken from, nor can it be added to. What should your response be? That's probably the right response, that, or probably the response you will have is, oh, geez, I gotta think on that. But Wes already knew the answer. <laughs> he, signed, he signed the bottom of the contract. Well, how, what are some ways that you could react to it? Um, you could, if it's something bad, you could say, you know, the verse he gives, he takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. I mean, you could Jobicize it. You could. <laughs> it's a Jobic response that you've given. Yes. Maybe a real question it raises for me is, like, what time is it? <laughs> you know, am I doing the thing that should be, doing, be done right now, or is there not that time anymore? It's right a good now? question. How about tragedy? Tragedy strikes your life. How about this? You have, we all have spouses. One of them is going to die. Soon. Where's that? Depending on, you know, how things went this morning, it may be. <laughs> what are the ways you could respond to that? You can get angry. And yes. Die. Okay, you can get very angry. And, and do what? Blame God. And blame God. Get angry and blame God. Okay. What else? I think there's a time for that. I think God <laughs> uses that as I'm serious. I mean, that's when he told. That's when he told Job. He's like, "Who are you? Did you know all this?" I mean, nice. God uses all of our various failures, and and He knows how we're going to react to things. I mean, He's God. He's the omniscient. So. I mean, to a certain extent, I had to let go of that in my life. Those times where I felt like I, I, I don't know what you call, was a bad Christian or whatever, because I wasn't constantly glorifying God in every. Mm -hmm. Which I'm not saying we shouldn't. We should obviously. That's yeah. what we should aspire mm -hmm. to because everything mm -hmm. is to God's glory. But I think God takes those times when you don't, and He teaches you those, those lessons and talks to you, and then you're able to come to a point where you are able to glorify Him yeah. in everything. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the person that shakes their fist at God, and, and I will say this, and there's plenty of scripture to back it up, just because someone in scripture has done that doesn't mean that they were in the right and Job was put in his place. I never, never make it a habit to blame God because I, I understand this. I don't want you to ever do that. But if you do, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay uh, because God will use that to correct you. And your understanding. Or you will allow it to destroy your life. And you'll say forever, how come you allowed this to happen to me, God? I'll never forgive you. You get weep and mourn. Yeah, there's a time for that. Instead of laughing at <clears throat> there's, a, there's a time for weeping and mourning. But I think it's also important for us to dispel very, very commonly taught not that I've necessarily ever heard it from Cyprus, but very commonly taught teaching from the pulpit that it's okay to be angry with God. On the face of it, no, it's not. It's not okay to be angry with God. 
However, that being said, being angry at God is not a deal breaker for God in your relationship. Yeah. So what we want to be sure of in any in case of any sin is to say it's wrong, but it's not a deal breaker with regard to the grace that he pours out on us. So I, I don't want to, I don't want you guys to get wrapped up in this teaching that says, okay, it's okay, so you do it thinking that it's okay and you never repent of that and you never come to closure with that and realize, okay, I was wrong. What can I learn from this experience, etc.? But it, it is often taught, and it's it's not yeah. okay. That's bugged me. I mean, it, it says it blatantly in Job. In all these things, Job did not sin by blaming God. And your next question should be? Chapter and verse, please. Well, I told you, go find the context. Well, that's not what I said. I didn't. <laughs> No, it, it does. Yeah, those, those, yeah. Now you're common. No, I'm I'm saying in, in what the what the scripture says. This is early on because Job does get lippy, <laughs> and then God comes down and says, "Who is this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who are you, buddy? All right. Uh, the, but the point is, God is making this beautiful tapestry, and it doesn't make sense to us because we're so near to our little section. <clears throat> And I love that song in The Prince of Egypt. Uh, Join the dance, the song that um, Jethro sings. Uh, it's a great song. It, it talks about how you, everybody's got their part to play. And the thing that they go through is, is part of it. And it's a beautiful tapestry. And in the end, hey, we all at least know that in the end, God wins. And we all live in glory with Him. We, we're going to suffer. All these things we're seeing in our lifetime. <clears throat> we're experiencing now. There's hellish things that are going on right now. But the way that you can apply it to your life, you've got an individual thing that you've got to apply it to. Okay? We all do. We have something individual. But you apply it to your life by, by resting in His sovereign will and allowing it to happen and not, not reacting like, well, what is a strange thing that's going on? Well, it's appointed alright uh, so God is in control and you can let it change your life and your decision making hey your decision making oh what will I do well something happens uh, events work in a certain way they're pointing you in a direction uh, go in that direction it's completely contrary to everything else that's going on yeah but it's the door that God has opened and it, this must be the appointed time for it work from home alright <laughs> Uh, just a question. How many that are here actually work from home? <laughs> I knew it was pretty high this week. <laughs> oh, none of the ladies who are safe. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. And you wonder why some people say, you're not really working, because you didn't admit it. And I know you're busting your tails. All right. Uh, God has put eternity into all of us, into everyone, right? But we don't fully get it. And you know what? That's Okay. We get that God has a plan. He has an eternal plan. And, and he's, in, he's sovereign and in total control. All right? And we can rest in that and, and say, yeah, it's okay. It is well with my soul because I know that God is going to, Romans eight twenty eight this thing. It's going to work out for the good. And God is testing us all. That's what, that's what we just read. God is testing us. He's testing us all in this. <coughs> and then don't worry if your future plans for what happened under the sun don't come to fruition after you're gone. Uh, you can focus on what's happening right now. You can set something up. You know, there's a great Christian organ. Oh, oh, oh here's a, uh, there's some great universities that were set up. Christian universities, like Harvard. How's Harvard doing now? Christian University? Very liberal. Very liberal. Prob uh, makes fun of Christians. I had the joy of going to the Harvard bookstore in Cambridge. Yeah, it was very unfriendly, shall I say, to Christians, and also to American capitalism. I think they had a shrine to Karl Marx, but... Yes. I was going to say about our country. Uh-huh. You know, it's founded on a lot of Christians. Well, that was the obvious one. <laughs> it was very good. <coughs> All right, uh, God is the source of our joy, right? Not circumstances. If circumstances are the source of your joy and circumstances change, what happens to your joy? 
Is it gone or is it gan? It's gan. <laughs> Dylan? I'm from Texas, boy. Thanks, uh, Pete. I can spend time up in Bassett like you. That's what he said. Do what? It has two syllables. That's what he just said. Yeah. Gone. Gone. Y'all passed the test. (coughs) So this is kind of lame. I'm glad that I put this one because I was going to put the the cave, the cave. Remember your failure at the cave. But uh, you all were right. This was a quote from Warren Worsby in his reaction to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 from his work, Be Satisfied. Um... So yeah, faith learns, to, and this is exactly what he was writing it about, <coughs> chapter 3, and you all were dead on, next slide. Uh, oh, and your big takeaway is, for your own life, whatever that thing is that you're worrying about, you need to stop worrying about that thing, and you need to embrace that thing, and say God's going to use that thing, whatever it is. And people who... People who aren't believers, for every for them, everything ends right there in that verse twenty two. So I saw there's nothing better than that oh, man to rejoice in his yes. work, but that's his lot. That's and, it. And that's I mean, he was the wisest man of his time back then, but at least he had God. And that was what three thousand years ago, and all of that's mm-hmm. what all of humanity is still coming at right now without God is Enjoy yourself the best you can with what you're doing because that's all you have. And that's where yep. they stop forever. That's and, it. I mean, if, if you don't have God, then that's that's the end for you. And that's it. And that's a really, I mean, depressing. If, 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 if that's where you stop, then everything that comes before that is viewed totally, totally different than if you know that there's more that comes after. You're not keeping the conclusion. <laughs> They reject the conclusion. That's just a hard. That's a hard spot to stop. I would hate to stop there. And some people like that because it makes them feel very validated in everything that they do. Very and It's just that's a scary place to stop for me. Do you love somebody like that? Many people like that. Many in our family. That's and they they take much pride in what they're doing here and now, even though they know it'll be gone afterwards. That's they're going to pour their hearts and souls into it now. Yeah. to do what they can now because they know it's just going to end stop. And they're, they're okay with that. Yeah. And we need to be clear that, that what Solomon is suggesting here is not that those things are bad. Because oh, right, he flat right. out says these things are from God. Right. But what he's saying is uh, there, there's an extent to which you have to frame that within a, within a broader vision sure. of life. You can enjoy those things because the rest of life pretty much bites but you have to realize that in the end, you've got to see this through the vision of yeah. fearing God. Yeah. Because if you, but like, like you said, if you stop there and don't realize these things are from God You're and that there's an that ultimate, box. yeah, exactly. That's, that's it. Uh, futility of politics. That's self-explanatory. <laughs> <laughs> okay, futility of politics. Let's look at chapter four, verses one through three. Jeremy, are, are you going? Is there any comment on his? Uh, Lack of distinction between people and animals. Mm-hmm. And oh yeah, sure. The uh, the lack of, of insight into eternity and what what that looks like. Right, right, right. Okay. the The point that he is making there is that uh, when you look at it from a physical standpoint, all right, from a temporal physical standpoint, we breathe the same air as the animals, right? We go, they go through their motions, we go through our motions, and we die, like the animals. And so, if you're looking at it from a temporal standpoint. We do not have any sort of advantage over the animals in that we're both going to die and return to the dust, as as we all do, right? And then his his statement about who knows whether the spirit of man or the breath of man goes up and the breath or spirit of animals go down. Is that your question also? Of what what have do all dogs go to heaven? No, it it was more of a question of. um, does his views on this and, and perhaps just lack of information that, that we have available to us now influence the um, thinking or the validity of, of the rest of what he has to say about futility? Because you, you see that if you're like, hey, if this life was all there is, yes, I agree. You yeah. know? And I think in the light of the New Testament, we have some different conclusions. 
So I'm not quite understanding, I guess, there. So are you saying that, or tell me again what you're saying. Okay. Say it in a different way. Um, <laughs> if you believed everyone went to the same place right. and that there's really no uh, eternal things, everything you could possibly do in life is, yes. is, is irrelevant. Yes. Um, I think that... Under the sun. Always, to me, I mean, to me, it's like he's almost got like it's not a it's not a logical flaw as if he's misinterpreted something. It's like a, I, I'm going to speak with all the information I have, but it's really not as much as God's given us later on through Revelation, I guess. And okay. So it, it calls into question a lot of the um, assumptions and conclusions that he gets to. Whether he believes in an afterlife is that? Yeah. Part of it. Yeah. Okay. So or, his. Or if, if it's if it's just between if it's just between me and God. Fear God and keep his commandments. Um, because that's really all you got. And you know, everything you do in life is meaningless. Um, all that striving, you know, which is which is different from you know, Paul who's going to strive quite a bit and see a lot of meaning meaning in it and a yes, lot of yes, uh, yes. significance. Yes. And if you have a chance to um, you know, if, if nothing under the sun is gonna last, all these things he's built and stuff like that, um, versus I and mean, really, what he was supposed to build uh, as the king of Israel. I mean, there there were there were some responsibilities of things that should have been built, and that should have been taught, and should have been passed on. Um, you know, that at least with with missions, and you know, you can change the world. Mm -hmm. I guess through through quite a bit of striving and stuff. Um, but he doesn't really have any of that in this one little sliver in, in the okay. whole book. Mm, okay. Well, here's good. The, good question. Good. Good point. Here's here's the thing. Remember when, whenever I start off in chapter one, I said this is the in a world where. Yeah. Okay. Right. So the yeah. world where he's creating is yep. under the sun. Yep. And you'll see this over and over again. Okay. So the context. Yeah. The context is under the sun. Right. And the context is it, it, if that's all there is under the sun, this is your life. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's eliminating an eternal perspective. Right. It's saying look. If this is all there is, and if this is what you're suggesting, that this is all there is, here's the reality of what that looks like. So he's transporting you into this very secular way of thinking, which is really weird for his time, but he's transporting you into this world where this is the limit. And in fact, I mean, this, this beast thing here is a perfect example. If this is the way you view things, when you die, who knows what happens? Yeah. I mean, beast goes here, man goes here. We don't know, because this is your perspective under the sun. And he uses that to frame his entire discussion of just delimiting the human experience between birth and death. Okay. So that that so he's might setting help. up an argument that he disagrees with in the end. He's setting up an argument that the uh, the redactor is the going redactor to yeah. will put a bookends in on it. Yeah. And say, now that all has been heard, here's the conclusion of the matter. Because Solomon's telling us what the matter is. In fact, let's Let's start, and I will read to you what's in 1 Kings, because this is kind of cool stuff. All right, 1 Kings 4.21 says, Now Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms, all the kingdoms, plural, from the river, that is the Euphrates, to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Verse 24. Uh, for he had dominion over everything west of the Euphrates, from Tifsa even to Gaza, over all the kings west of the river, and he had peace on all sides around about him. 29 through 34. Now God gave Solomon wisdom and very great discernment and breadth of mind, like the sand that is on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the sons of the east, and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan, the Ezraite, than He-Man. He's wiser than He-Man, says it right there. Uh, Calcal and Darda, the sons of Mahal. And his fame was known in all the surrounding nations. He also spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. He spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon, even to the hyssop that grows on the wall. He spoke also of animals and birds and creeping things and fish 
Men came from all peoples to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. Him writing from a secular perspective has plenty of backing. If you read what Josephus has to say about it, he had correspondence with all these kings. They would write each other uh, wisdom riddles. And they even had bets. If you can't answer my question, and his favorite one to do that with was King Hiram of, uh, of Phoenicia. That's one of his favorites. But he, he would have correspondence with all these. He has a secular perspective. Okay? And he is rubbing shoulders with all these people that have this kind of secular perspective. So this, this further should help you understand where he's drawing from his observations. It's not just Israel, because he's got people coming in from all over the world that he's talking to. And he has letters going out and letters coming in. Okay? And he's likely been to many of these places. All right. So, uh, yes, sir. And it, this isn't specific to this part, but like, did his wisdom, I know God granted it to him, but was that through the Spirit somehow, or was that just a poof, you have this from now on and you don't need? I think he, because he asked for discernment to lead the people, and God said, I will make you wiser than anyone else. And so, was that wisdom imparted to him, or was he able to look at a situation and understand it? It was given by God. Okay, but it was an opening also of the mind, so that when he saw something happening, he could respond. It wasn't like, this is going to happen, and this is how you have to respond. Right? But it is imparted by God, and he gains it through experience. And this book, of course, details a lot of the experience that he went through, and a lot of observation, especially on account of all the kingdoms that were reporting to him, right? But I mean, I guess I'm asking, couldn't it have been imparted through the Spirit somehow, or is that not okay because Jesus had not sent in us the Spirit as our helper? Are there special circumstances? Oh, that's okay. Kind of, All right. So you're, you're asking, where, are you you're asking about what's the, the source of the wisdom? Well, I, I know God. But, <laughs> Well, here's the, here's the yeah. thing. It, it is okay to see the Spirit in operation in the Old Testament. Absolutely. That's not the issue. The, the issue we would have is saying that the Spirit has been universally given to the people of the covenant people of God prior to Pentecost. That's where we're going to have a problem. But the Spirit is given to Solomon, or excuse me, uh, to... Uh, Saul. No, Samson, thank you. Samson. Spirit's given to Samson. Spirit's given to David, because David speaks in Psalm 51 about don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Um, there, there are various times when we see the Spirit operative in the Old Testament period. The issue is more so a blanket granting of the Holy Spirit amongst the covenant people of God in that particular time. But there's so, no evidence per se that says it was given to Yeah, Spirit. I don't think the text says that. Okay. It just no. says that God granted it. And it might help to think of wisdom in terms of not a body of knowledge, but rather the critical ability to analyze a situation in such a way as to come up with the best result. Okay, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Then I looked again at all the acts of oppression which were being done under the sun, and behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed, and that they had no one to comfort them. And on the side of the oppressors was power, but they had no... On the side of the oppressors was power, but they had no one to comfort them. So I congratulated the dead who were already dead, more than the living who are still alive. But better off than both of them is the one who has never existed, who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. Um, so, we've already kind of answered this. Where could Solomon have observed oppression? Also Israel, right? He could definitely observe oppression. You're not going to have perfect people in any nation, right? He could go out to his uh, chief of forced labor. <laughs> Spend the day with his own. Bada bing. Yeah. There you, there's oppression right there. Your dad put a heavy burden on us. Are you going to lighten it, Rehoboam? <laughs> okay. Uh, so we, we know, we have testimony that he was putting, he was an oppressor also. So where is the oppression in our society? Are you feeling oppressed today, anybody? I am. Horribly so. And I blame wisdom. 
Yes, dear. You blame me. <laughs> <laughs> I think the frightening thing about oppression in North American and, and even European society is that it is so subtle it's become something that we don't even see. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't have people assaulting us as we go to church, but the subtlety of the oppression and the persecution is so... It, it's almost like the... Uh, the we hear so often of the frog who sits in the water that slowly begins to boil. Yeah. That we've gotten okay with being treated a particular way or, mm-hmm. or things have allowed to happen. So it's gotten to a point where we're just, we're kind of missing the fact that there are things going on around us that are wrong. And so that works. Huh? We are suffering the sufferings of, of Lot. Okay? In the sense that righteous Lot suffered because he lived in an evil society that embraced evil and rejected God and ultimately they embraced the worst kinds of evil that God destroyed so the oppression that we are under right now it's cloaked because you're all struggling to find it okay what about the embracing of murder legalized murder through abortion how many millions of children are killed what about embracing of evil lifestyles through film that you grew up with all of you, all of us, right? Melrose Place, 90210, go out there and have a, have a good time, right? It'll be fun. The damage that it does to you for the rest of your life. When you have to uh, pretend that it's, it's okay, all the, all the things that you did, well, you don't have to pretend. You can let it go, of course. But the evil things that you've done in your past, whether it's drug abuse, sexual abuse, uh, maybe you were a jerk, (laughs) (laughs) or whatever. But you learned it because we have a construct in society through the media that manipulates you to be accepting of these sorts of activities as though premarital sex is the norm and the right thing that you should be doing. It is oppression because it ruins lives. It gives people STDs. It gives them children that they don't want, that they can go dispose of through violent means. But it's been sanitized. Because we don't see it. You know, (laughs) go look at the pictures. Go Google those images and tell me what you think. I didn't mean to sound like Christopher Walken there. (laughs) I, I don't like being thought of as a fool. I feel Boom, that's another one. Oppressed that way, which is, I mean, and then part of it's probably pride too, but, um, you know, I consider myself a fairly intelligent person, um, and coming to the conclusion that the Bible is true mm-hmm. is such a anti-intellectual conclusion, yep. and so people look at me, you know, incredulously saying, how? You're smart. Why? You're smart. Mm-hmm. What's wrong with you? Mm-hmm. You know, we thought you were smart. We thought, yeah. you know, and that's, that's hard for me to, to, to deal with that 